One of the things that we've been focused on is helping teams understand how to run more effective meetings. So imagine that everyone jumps into a brainstorming session. Well, they work best when you have a facilitator that knows how to have an engaging session. And so we've been working on courses and other things to help people recognize how to effectively bring people together and get the best ideas out. I think that, that that's one of the big opportunities in all of this that is happening right now is the, the combination of technology with a shift in our skill set for being effective collaborators. Those two things can come together and that's when you really see the, the step change in how things work. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Future of Work. My guest today is Nathan Rollins, CMO at Lucid. And Nathan, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jacob. For people who might not be familiar with the company, what do you guys do? So at Lucid, we create a set of products that we call visual collaboration applications. So these are applications where people can come together over the web from anywhere in the world to work together on a shared canvas. It may be they come together to brainstorm ideas or maybe to work on a diagram to figure out a customer support process. These Anything where you're trying to build something together and you need to do it very visually, you turn to Lucid to do that. And I'm guessing as a result of COVID, business must have been booming for you guys because now everybody is turning to these tools and platforms, right? Well, it's been, it has actually been really fun to see. And this, as we talk about the future of work, I think this is one of the things that's interesting is that <clears throat> what COVID really did is that it forced everyone to rethink the way that they collaborate. Yeah. And what we've found largely is that what uh, many people uh, experienced was that it wasn't really working well before. And so <laughs> as we shifted to... Um, <laughs> To being in you know in a virtual world, we had to work differently. And most people that we talked to have found you can actually work more effectively when you decide that you're going to not try to replicate the bad ways that we were working before in a virtual environment. Yeah. So it's been it's been fun to see. Yeah, of course. Uh, how many employees do you guys have at Lucid, by the way? We are just shy of about a thousand employees right now. Wow. Okay, you guys are way larger than I thought. For some reason, I thought it was a much smaller company, a thousand employees. I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a substantial company right there. It is. And you know, the, you know, our goal is to bring this type of collaboration to every knowledge worker on the planet. So we, we have some pretty ambitious goals. We've got a long way to go and we're, we're excited to do that. Now, before I pushed record, we were talking about the old days uh, where we got connected. Ah, uh, man, how many years ago was this when you were at Jive Software? Do you remember how many years ago that was? Oh, it would have Six? been... Yeah, well, Six, seven? Uh, at least. Yeah. Right. So it uh, would have been back in 2011, probably. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. A decade ago. Jeez. Time flies. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember. So I wrote my first book in 2012, and it was called The Collaborative Organization. And I remember at that time, a lot of these softwares were just becoming mainstream. There was uh, Salesforce Chatter, there was Jive, there was Lithium. Uh, there was Yammer, as some people might remember. Mm -hmm. When you look back almost a decade ago at these technologies and you look at where we are today, have you seen a lot of evolution and change and transformation and just their adoption or even how the platforms look and are used? Yes and no. And this this is, again, something that I think is fun is that as I think back in the days of, the days of Jive and certainly the other applications that you just talked about, we we shifted to much more social ways of I think it was more communication in many ways than collaboration. Yeah. And so I think collaboration sorry, excuse me, communication has evolved pretty dramatically over the course of the last decade. You see, you know, Slack has taken off, other app similar applications have. But uh, when it has come to collaboration, we've really we tend to go back to these these same modes of we're textual collaboration. We're trying to uh, comment on documents and, you know, get our points across. And so that's where I think things are, haven't changed as dramatically. 
We're, yeah. we've, been, we've become much better at being social in communication, but when it comes to collaboration, we tend to just try to push it through with endless amounts of communication and, and pretend that that is some sort of collaboration. I actually wonder what happened to a lot of those platforms. Um, you don't really hear much, I mean, do you hear about any of those anymore? Yeah, they've no, they, they've been not like really, acquired no. or yeah, I think a lot of them have been acquired and absorbed into other businesses. They've been been absorbed in different ways, and I, I think the concepts have evolved. Where you know you you take something like Chatter, it it certainly evolved pretty dramatically over the course of the last decade, and you know being pulled as a feature into many different things. But I so the the concepts have pulled through, but. I, we still certainly believe that there's this next evolution in the way that we collaborate. And it's really mm. getting back to just kind of how we fundamentally like to work as humans. Yeah. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Uh, so kind of a fun question for you. And I'm, I'm curious, go back a decade to like 2011, 2010, when you had to sell this kind of software to organizations versus when an organization is coming to you now, is there a big difference as far as companies understanding what it is, why it's important, or are we still kind of like, why do we need this? Why can't we just do email? I think the biggest difference right now is in the way that these products are adopted. So hmm. back a decade ago, we still very much had to have a conversation first and then adoption followed. Yeah, uh, you know, certainly at Lucid, we have uh, a product-led growth model where you know, millions of users are, are using our products. And then once you've proven out success, you can have the conversation at a company level and say, by the way, this is really working. Should we scale this? Yeah. And so in, in this approach, we've made it easier for the transformation to happen because you've removed that initial friction of, is this, is this really going to work to begin with? Hmm. Okay. One of the big questions I get, and I'm sure you get asked this a lot as well, do we still need in-person collaboration? So obviously you have a lot of people, a lot of big brands who are using your software. Do they ever come to you and say, hey, you know what? We don't need in-person work anymore. We're just going to shift purely to technology. We, we certainly have, have talked to many companies that are shifting to completely virtual uh collaboration in, in particular because of the, the current environment. But what we found is that many of them are saying, even if we can get back together at some point at scale, what we have learned over the course of the last year and a half will cause us to collaborate differently when we are all in the same room. So mm. one of the one of the stories that jump, uh, jumps out to me here is you know, talking with a vice president at a, at a bank, and she was talking about working with her UX team and how by doing brainstorms virtually, she discovered that there were people on her team that had a voice that she hadn't heard before because <laughs> their, their ideas would come through when they were uh, brainstorming with sticky notes on this virtual board. Whereas if they were all in a room and talking, those same people may not speak up. And so yeah. Um, there are all sorts of these sorts of dynamics that I think are, are causing companies to say, hey, even if we can get back together, let's not fall back into the same tropes of the past. And let's let's figure out how there there can be a mix of virtual and physical, even if we're all in the same room. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, I wanted to kind of look at the big picture of, of trends that you are paying attention to, or maybe trends that your company is paying attention to when when we think about the future of work. Uh, so what are the trends you're paying attention to? There are a handful that come to mind just right off the top. One is that the things that we tend to collaborate around anymore are significantly more complex than they were five or 10 years ago. We, we like to talk about the fact that we build for builders. And anymore, that's virtually anyone within a company. Yeah. There's so much technology, we're pushing so much forward, we're trying to innovate, innovate so quickly that we're, we're solving really complex problems. So when we need to get together and collaborate, we're not talking typically about just minor tweaks here and there. We're talking about big things. And, and because of that, the type of collaboration uh, 
the way that we collaborate needs needs to shift to allow for that level of complexity and dialogue and interconnection that inev- inevitably comes out of it. So that's that's part one. Okay. Another thing that we're seeing is that more and more companies are shifting to agile ways of working, not just within mm-hmm. software development. They're they're pushing for more self directed smaller teams where they can work with more autonomy. And that's fantastic, but it presents an interesting challenge. Uh, you know, we've we've talked in the in terms of the way that we work and collaborate. We've talked about silos for decades, but for most of that time, we've talked about it as if there are a handful of silos in a company. When teams become more agile, you can actually create just thousands of mini silos. And so, what mm. what we see is the need for basically a, a a lingua franca or a system of record for what you're trying to build so that as teams work together, they have, they have the common blueprint for what they're trying to accomplish. And as work is handed off from team to team, it can be more effective. So you bring those two things together. The fact that we're, we're building very complex things and we're doing it in, uh, in a way where we have very f- nimble, agile teams. And it makes it, it makes it, uh, I, makes it so that we need to rethink the way that we go about having these conversations around collaboration. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, those are two big trends. Uh, any others that you're particularly thinking about when it pertains to the world of work? The The other one is just around the, the shift in preference for the way that we work. There's you know, uh-huh. some of this is the shift to more hybrid work environments. But also, as as more and more people come into the into the workforce that are digital natives, they they come in and they they they're used to using applications that are highly interactive and highly visual, and you hand them an email client and say, figure out how to build the next product using email and you know some some video calls. It, it falls down. And so the expectation for the, the way that we work uh, is, is very different. Um, one of the things that we've noted, just you know, veering off for, here for a second, our products are used very frequently within K-12 or uh, you know, student, with K-12 students at, uh, uh, at elementary schools. And wow. so we're, we're, we're seeing already that you, know, you, you have these these young children that are that are learning differently and the expectation then as you you know you move through into the workforce we, we're expecting a sea change in the you know, the expectation of what software can do to help people work and think in the way that they do naturally yeah it's crazy i mean i have a five-year-old now and i mean she's when i think about how she grew up i mean she grew up with me saying like Hey Siri or Alexa. And I know it's like one of them are going to go off right now because they're all around me. Um, I, I mean, she's grown up with seeing me order things on, on Amazon. It's like, what the hell is Amazon? This place where you can get anything that you want to your house. Like whose Siri? Is it a family member? Like what's, what's Alexa? And, uh, you know, she's using screens now. I mean, she doesn't have an iPad, but she knows how to, you know, use my phone and look for pictures and videos which is insane to me because I can only imagine what it's going to be like when she gets older. And, you know, when I look back, it's easy to think of, uh, you know, CDs as outdated technologies and uh, cassette tapes, but everything now feels like so modern and so cool that it's hard for me to imagine any of what we're doing now is being outdated by the time my daughter grows up. Like it's, it's just weird to think about. And so I have I have children that are you know, in high school and starting at university, and what always the thing that always surprises me is how little they rely on email. Hmm. The, the The worst way of trying to communicate with my children is through email, and because <laughs> they, they they don't think to do that. So yeah. imagine these generations entering the workforce and. Their you know, collaboration then is expected to be over email or you know, they, they've all grown up with Google Docs and these sorts of things, but they've all also grown up with applications where they can visualize just about anything and they, you know, they can talk with each other over video calls constantly. So the, the expectation coming in then is, well, we should be able to just work wherever we are, however we want. 
And so it's putting pressure on organizations to to rapidly adjust to this yeah. this new workforce. I remember um, you know, there were some of those science fiction movies and maybe it was like Minority Report. You know, those cool sci-fi movies where you just see somebody there in front of a screen and they're just like manipulating things with their hands. You're like, man, that's cool. But it, it seems like something like that is not necessarily in the too distant future, especially, you know, Facebook's rebranding itself to Meta, which is creepy in a whole separate conversation. Uh, but it seems like eventually that kind of stuff might be possible when the visual collaboration medium. So I would argue that the the most important parts of that are possible today, right? We mm. it's it's not to the masses where people are doing this with VR headsets, and I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I I'm skeptical about people sitting around conference tables <laughs> with with headsets, but that's just me. The uh, but imagine have you ever been in one of those exercises? in a conference room where you do the sticky note exercise and everyone you know, yep. puts their ideas up and then you do the dot voting. So one of our products is a virtual version of that. And it just makes so much more sense because you can have dozens, if not you know, hundreds of people all adding their ideas. And then you can turn to the software and say, why don't you make sense of what we just put here? So instead of everyone going on a break and having one person try to assemble all the sticky notes into clusters, you can rely on software to do it. And you can you know, move ideas around and group them and cluster them and then say, now these best ideas, push them off to, you know, to JIRA to track them. So you know, what we've done is we've, we've made it possible for these, these common activities to be really augmented by you know, the power of computing so that as humans, we can spend our time really thinking about great ideas rather than um, shifting uh, stickies around a room or pushing ideas, you know, transcribing, transcribing ideas from sticky notes onto a spreadsheet. Do you have any specific examples of how a company might use visual collaboration, like any story, just something that we can like wrap our minds around what this actually looks like? So i give you a, a common example. Uh, I'll go with new product development. So imagine that, uh, let's take a bank. As a bank, you've decided you're going to build a new application. And as you might imagine, there are, there may be 20, 30, 70 different scrum teams that are involved in that plan. So the first thing is bringing a team together on a virtual board where they can brainstorm what needs to be built. And okay. you know, we, we have capabilities where you can break into rooms and you know, have a sticky note exercise and come up with the ideas. Then the next phase is you say, okay, we, we need to figure out which of these ideas we're going to act on. And so you can have voting yeah. sessions where people can upvote the best ideas and put emoji on the best ideas and so on. <laughs> and then go through freeform planning where you, you start moving things around on a board to say, well, let's do this group of things first and this second and so on. So you know, you, you're very rapidly building out a, a freeform plan. Then the next step is teams need to figure out how to build all of this. So one of the ideas may be that we need to build this new mobile application. Well, that's going to change your customer support process. So instead of having an email chain about what needs to change, a team can jump into our diagramming application and all together at the same time, uh, build out the, the flow for that customer support process. Hmm. And then you know the final example would be yeah, another thing that's likely to be is that the team says, we're going to deploy this application and we're going to need to build a whole bunch of AWS infrastructure. Well, you can yeah. take one of our applications, point it at AWS and say, visualize our AWS infrastructure. And then the team can get together on a board and determine what needs to change. So, you know, all the way through what you have is this, this, you know, the, the new place where people gather is this virtual board and they can work side by side, even if they aren't face to face. Got it. Okay. Uh, it seems like part of what makes technology successful though, is, is the people, right? I mean, it's how you structure your teams. It, maybe it's the culture. What's the relationship there between using technology in a successful way versus like the culture aspect or, or how you structure your teams to, to use that technology? There, there is a lot there. Uh, so one of the things that we've been focused on is helping 
teams understand how to run more effective meetings. So hmm. imagine that everyone jumps into a brainstorming session. Well, they work best when you have a facilitator that knows how to have an engaging session. And so we've been working on courses and other things to help people recognize how to effectively bring people together and get the best ideas out. I think that, that that's one of the big opportunities in all of this that is happening right now is the, the combination of technology with a shift in our skill set for being effective collaborators. Those two things can come together and that's when you really see the, the step change in how things work. Got it. All right. Well, now I have to ask you, since you mentioned meetings and uh, you know, everybody's doing virtual meetings nowadays, what have you learned about creating successful meetings? So for people who are watching and listening, they want to have better meetings. What should they be doing? The biggest thing I think is the simplest in terms of concept, which is ensuring that there's intention in what you're trying to accomplish in the meeting. And uh, in particular, if a team is coming together with a goal of driving some sort of change, it's so much more effective if the team can work together in determining exactly what needs to change rather than just talking about it. So again, mm -hmm. this is the, the idea of if you can bring people in and say, instead of discussing how we need to change our support process, let's get in there together and and war game this let's let's start moving things around let's make those changes and so as teams have uh have the ability to to work together in a meeting rather than ch just talk about the work that needs to happen as a result of the meeting they can be so much more effective ah uh, okay yeah i like that that's a that's a good tip for people um what happens and i i see this all the time and you might remember this back in the day uh at jive there's always this idea of like, oh, cool, new technology, but then you always get resistance to technology. Like somebody who says no, or teams that say no, or maybe you're an employee, you wanna use tech, your leader says no. So first part of the question is, what are some of the common reasons why people resist using technology? And then any advice on how to overcome that resistance? I think the biggest part is simply our comfort with the status quo. And this is where the last year and a half, I think, played a huge role because it forced us, we had no choice but to work differently. And so yeah. you now have a critical mass of people that have adopted new ways of working. And I, I think that the, the, the huge opportunity for individuals and teams and companies is to ensure that as we have the option of going back to working the old way, that we don't slip into those habits just because they're they're what they're the well-worn genes right uh, it, we, we need to be willing to say no we're going to we're going to continue uh, pushing on in terms of what we have seen in term uh, of I guess let me back up in terms of what we have seen be successful in adopting change it typically comes from the ground up where individual teams, start shifting their behaviors and then they spread that to other teams and it just you build this groundswell of change now it gets married with higher level initiatives within a company so it may be that a company is working on something like a digital transformation initiative and they talk with teams and they say well here's a way that we can do it because we've we've experienced this new way of working let's use this to help drive an initiative but it's most successful when you already have these groups that have adopted both the technology and the change in practice. Mm. Ah, I see. Yeah, it's um, it, it's really interesting because this, and I don't know if it comes up as much now, like you said, as a result of COVID. But I remember back in the day, people would just constantly push back, like, "Why do I need to do this? What's this for? I'm happy with the way I get things done uh, the way it is now." And I always tell this this anecdote, right? Nobody likes the journey to Disneyland, but everybody likes Disneyland when they get there. Meaning nobody likes the, the process of change, but once the change happens and people see it, everyone's like, oh, wow, that's not so bad. Uh, so it, it sounds like similar, similar to stuff what, to what you're talking about there. And absolutely. 
And I, I think we are most effective when we make it easy for, we, we use the term change agents. We have used it in the industry for, for years. When those people can start making the changes themselves without requiring some sort of big strategic conversation to begin with. Yeah. Back in the day, in order to adopt new technology, it required some big strategic conversation at a company level. Now, it's simply a matter of someone going out on the web and saying, I'm going to try something new. And typically within five or 10 minutes, they can be <laughs> trying something new and yeah. then they can spread that. And so that, that's, where, that's where we see this, uh, this movement really growing. Okay. So let's say I'm an organization and I want to use some kind of new technology, whether it's yours or I don't know, maybe it's some other platform, project management, ta you know, so many platforms out there. What have you seen that works as far as getting technology adoption from broad based employee uh, groups? So what I've seen be most successful is that uh, some of what we just talked about where it's, you know, it starts with small teams, but then you start attaching to specific use cases within the company. So, you know, it mm. could be that a team starts with an engineering and they, they use it for a particular project, but then they share it with someone in a completely different group. Uh, maybe it's someone within, within sales sees it and they, it's most successful when they can attach it to some sort of very specific use case for them. So, you know, for us, what this means is we, we create hundreds and hundreds of different templates so that people can take the, the ideas of this platform that we have and they can see quickly how it could apply in some specific thing that they are doing. Uh, I think mm -hmm. gone are the days where we can trust that you just hand this platform to a company and expect the company to figure out how to tell employees to use it. Uh, you know, vendors uh, need to hand the, uh, the, the, basically the roadmap to users to help them see how they can go from where they are today to this new way of working. And it needs to be something that they can do in about 15 minutes or they're, they're not likely to adopt it very quickly. Yeah, I like that idea of templates of basically making it easy for people to get because otherwise you just give somebody the tool and you might talk about how great it is, but if they can't make that connection, then they're going to say, nah, I don't know. So the templates I think is, is a great, um, great approach to do that. Uh, why do you think some organizations, fail? and I don't know if you've had this happen to you guys, um, why do some organizations fail when it comes to technology? And I, I don't know, have you ever had a company use your software and then they're like, okay, we got to stop using it. It's not working out. I mean, why might that happen? So I'll answer the second question first and we can back up. We typically don't see that because it starts with end users to begin with. And so by the time it's become a, co a corporate decision, they've already seen success. Where, mm. where it tends to fail is, I think, the other side of that coin, where you have some sort of broad initiative within a company that doesn't have the backing of employees that really want to use it. Um, when I first started in my career, almost all software was purchased by someone very senior and pushed down to everyone else, and you didn't have yeah. a choice. It doesn't, it, today, that just doesn't work in most cases. Unless it's something that you absolutely must use to get your job done, you're likely to reject it because you, you know, it's what we were just talking about. It's hard to connect the dots between how you work and yeah. how you can work. If you can get the end users using it first and then grow from there, uh, you can really avoid that the risk of rejection within the organization because it, it just has a life of its own. Okay. No, that makes sense. Uh, I wanted to shift gears a little bit to talk. Um, so I read that you guys are one of the best led companies in the U.S., according to Inc. Magazine. We are. So 1,000 people, you guys got that award. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, A, how you got that award, and what does being a best led company mean? What's your leadership style, approach, philosophy? Um, what are you guys doing over there? So... I've worked at many different companies, and every company has, of course, uh, values and different, uh, you, know, you have your own culture. One of the things that's very interesting about Lucid is that very, very early on in the company, 
the the early employees codified the values of the company and uh, said, "We need what we are doing is working. We like working together. We like doing what we're doing." Let's let's figure out what the essence of that success has been, and that turned into the values that that Lucid has. And so, you know, beyond having values painted on a wall somewhere, this it's basically the playbook for the way that the company works. And yeah, so an example being uh, teamwork over ego is one of our core values. And it, I would imagine, if you were to talk to uh, people at Lucid, you would hear it from virtually everyone because it's this just this core idea of we need to win as teams, and so that you know that really drives uh, a lot of what we do. Another one is it's it's a it's a buzzword that doesn't seem that unique innovation, but the way that we apply it is is vital. I, I noticed this uh, early on uh, after I joined Lucid several years ago, which is we're a highly experimental culture with uh, an acceptance for uh, for for learning as we go along. I, uh, I, I we, we went through a project that was just an utter failure. And I remember sitting down with Carl, our CEO, and explaining what had happened. It just, it, it was a disaster. And you just looked are at you me able and said, to, Are you able to share what happened before you tell this story? Oh, absolutely. So every, um, every year, we would we would do some sort of creative push within marketing marketing to try to get our products in front of people that would never consider the products to begin with. So something <laughs> super creative. And so one of, one of the things that we had decided we would do is we would build the world's largest diagram, and we were going to crowdsource this. And we had talked oh to Guinness, God. and we were going to have them. Uh, uh, have them certify it, and we had built an interface so that people could basically do this choose your own adventure uh, style diagram where you know you would give them a prompt and a story and they would tell you the next part and imagine that that gets built into this gigantic gigantic diagram. We anticipated that we would get some some raunchy things you know submitted, and so we had built tech in to to do that. We dramatically underestimated what we would get from the internet. And so it, it just, the the sort of things that people were putting in were just so horrible. And there was so much of it that we we just had to kill the project. And wow. uh, so, you know, I sat down with Carl, our CEO. and What, what sort of stuff were they put like adult, not safe for oh, work kind of content? It, it, it was that, and it was violent. And it was just, it, oh. you know, in retrospect, we should have we should have expected all of it. Yeah. But um, there, there was so much. It just, it was, it was untenable to even continue with this project. So, <laughs> I, you know, I sat down with Carl, our CEO, and explained it to him, and he just looked at me and said, "Okay, so what did we learn?" And what was interesting with this, he actually uh, has talked about this at some conferences. At the same time, we had a, uh, you know, we we had pose this challenge of how do we help people that would never consider our products think about our products. And so our creative director was talking with an engineer and the engineer came up with this idea, said, what if we tried to explain memes using diagrams? <laughs> and and um, so they, they quickly hammered out this video that explained uh, pet lingo on the internet in a diagram. And... Okay. One day, uh, you know, I was walking down the hall. Our our creative director stopped me with his laptop and played it and said, "I'd love to try this out. Can we post this?" And you know, it was the sort of thing that you you look at it and, and you're like, I I don't know if this is gonna work. And so he posted it on I want to say it was a Thursday or Friday. Leaves uh, on a on a hiking trip, and over the weekend, it just blows up. That first video alone, within a short period of time, had 30 million views. So 30 million? Oh, yeah. So this program overall... Oh, I got to uh, see this video. Oh, there, it was... Um, uh, we, we've done several of them. Uh, we haven't done uh, any for the last couple of years, but we, we, we did a bunch of them. And the, the program overall netted somewhere in the ballpark of a half billion views. 
That's insane. It was it was named the the most uh, the, the only ad that mattered by Ad Week a couple years ago. Oh, and so, but what was interesting was the thing that we planned failed. The thing that was organic and you know that the, the teams had this harebrained idea. Let's try this. Worked phenomenally well. And so, from a culture perspective, that that's what really makes the company tick. How do we how do we get ideas going and make sure that people understand that, you know, we can continue to innovate and come up with ideas and that, uh, you know, maybe it'll be the next great ad. Maybe it won't, but let's give it a shot. I love that story. Uh, how do you encourage that? I mean, that's one of the other things that I get a lot of questions from leaders from is they say, how do we encourage that innovation? We want our employees to speak up and come forward with ideas, but they just don't do it. How do you create that culture? Um, I think for one, it's, there's a constant evolution as we've grown it, you know, it's the sort of thing that we, we need to constantly reinforce and it gets, it can get hard when people are moving really fast, but yeah. I, I think a lot of it comes from feeling safe that it's okay to try something that may not be a huge success yeah. in, in the case of that video that I just talked about, it was the safe space of saying, I don't know, maybe this will work, maybe it won't. Let's give it a shot. And the fact that, you know, this engineer and creative director had hammered something out over a, the course of a couple of days, they, they had the confidence that, you know what, I, I, think, I think we're going to be okay trying something new. So it really comes back to those core values of just let's experiment, let's learn, and let's try things. So to be a best-led company, I'm assuming that means you have a lot of great leaders inside the organization. So what is it that your leaders do? What do, what do you teach them? What are the skills, the behaviors that you guys look for in a great leader? So the, the first part is really, as we, as we interview, we look for these core values. And I, I want to say that it's, it's very different than looking for culture. People can come huh. from very different okay. backgrounds. They can have different <clears throat> approaches. They need to, we, we want that sort of that level of diversity, but it's really important that uh, the people we hire adhere to these core values, that they, that they value teamwork over ego, that they value innovation and creativity, these sorts of things. So that's, that's the first part. The second part is we we've, we've have a fantastic people ops team that has built out very structured leadership training where you know, we have... Okay you know, a 100, 200, and 300 level series of trainings that everyone that's managing people goes through to ensure that we understand the, you know, everything from the basics of managing effectively to motivation and how to, how to motivate teams. And so that, that's helped us as we've scaled to ensure that we, that we, can, we can take those values and apply them effectively, even when the company has changed, you know, changes dramatically every year because of the number of people that we bring in. That's one of the things that I always tell companies, right? It, values, having the values doesn't really mean anything. It's how those values actually come to life and how they're manifested. Um, so I guess for you guys, it starts at the hiring process where you want people who have personal values that align with your corporate values. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. And if not, then you just say, Hey, not a good fit. We, we, we look for that carefully. We, we take hiring incredibly seriously. For, you know, for the first couple of years I was at the company, Carl, our CEO, still interviewed anyone that we put an offer out to. Now, we're at wow. the point that that's untenable, but we, you know, as an executive team, we review every candidate that we are going to put an offer out to to make sure that we are, uh, that we're, we are, watching for those values and we're hiring great people and that we're looking um, to for you know diverse ways of thinking and diversity in general like all of those things are a, a vital part of the way that we hire which really then makes everything else so much easier mm. it's also i suppose challenging now right everyone talks about how uh, talent is becoming harder to bring into the company so i suppose it's the organizations with that leadership piece that are going to have an easier time of attracting and retaining the best people. Absolutely. Huh. All right. Um, well, when we think about um, leadership, maybe one other question for you on this would be around uh, mistakes or, or failures that leaders make. Have you noticed leaders inside your company? Is there 
Something that is common amongst leaders who are not quite able to grow in their careers or something that holds them back, that if they did this one thing, they would really be able to go to the next level, but it's this one thing that's keeping them. It's a really good question. And off the top of my head, I'm going to say no, which is, (laughs) I will continue to think about it, but I... I'm not coming up with with that one thing that tends to hold people back. Or maybe what do you look for when you're thinking of promoting leaders, uh, you know, bringing in leaders to to senior level positions? You know, the values get you so far. What gets you to the next step? So we, for each role, we look at the the aptitudes for that particular role. And, you know, so it, it's being successful. But one of the things that I, I've seen over the course of my career that's interesting is that there, there's a huge leap between being a successful individual contributor and being a successful leader because yeah. that, that heads down mentality of an individual contributor can be a challenge when you shift to being a leader and you need to motivate and delegate and everything else. And so that's where, as you know, we of course look for people that we believe can, can, can make that shift and have demonstrated usually by taking on leadership projects with, without taking on that role formally, then they, they, they can prove out that they can make that shift from being an individual cr- mm. contributor to, to leading out in one way or another. Oh, yeah. And, you know, honestly, I think some people struggle with making that shift, right? Um, I've talked to lots of people who are great individual contributors. They get promoted and they have a hard time moving away from that mentality of doing the work towards helping other people do the work or yes. towards overseeing how people do the work. Uh, that's, it's not always an easy thing to overcome. It is not. So that, but that's an important, an important one. And back on what we were talking about earlier with the, you know, the structured programs that we put in place, a lot of what we do early on is for, for a new manager to try to help, help them make that shift so that they, yeah. they recognize that they're, they need to be deliberate in the way that they, they, they shift. Yep. No, makes sense. Uh, well, we covered quite a lot of stuff today. Uh, is there anything else that you want to touch on that I didn't get a chance to ask you? I, I don't think so. I, I would, I would say as we close out here, you, you started by asking me about what I've observed over the last decade of you know, watching the collaboration industry. And I think the main thing I would suggest is, you know, as, as your listeners listen to this is to to step back and say, what have I learned in the last year and a half? I was talking with a, mm. an analyst who said something that I, I think made a lot of sense is, imagine that the last year and a half was basically the Peter Parker moment for collaboration, right? Where, where we, you know, we, we, something just changed and we discovered that we have mm. a superpower that we didn't realize was there. And if we think of it that way, then we then we say, okay, now that I have the superpower, how am I going to approach things moving forward? And how do I ensure that this becomes a permanent change and not just something that I had to do for a period of time? Hmm. I like that Peter Parker moment. Uh, well, where can people go to learn more about you, about the company, anything that you want to mention for people to check out? I would encourage them to go to lucid.co. And check it out there. Uh, they can check out our, we have individual products, Lucid Chart, Lucid Spark, and Lucid Scale. Can certainly okay. go to those websites as well to get uh, information about the products and try them out on their own. Very cool. Well, Nathan, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with me. It's been a long time, uh, but thank you for uh, coming on today and sharing your insights. Thank you, Jacob. It was fantastic chatting with you again. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again, Nathan Rollins, check out his company, Lucid. They're doing some pretty cool stuff and I'm sure they're hiring as well. Right, Nathan, you guys hiring? Absolutely. (laughs) All right, so maybe we'll get some new uh, new candidates uh, after this interview. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) All right, everyone, I will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks again for tuning into the show and don't forget to go to sixleadershiptrends.com 
to grab a copy of my brand new PDF, which is going to walk you through the six trends that are shaping leadership and what it means to be a leader. And it will also give you action items for what you should be doing for each one of these six trends to adapt and evolve so that you can be a better leader in the future of work. Again, that is six leadershiptrends.com. You can either spell out the number six in the URL or just use the number six in the URL. They will both take you to the same place. Thanks again for tuning in.